This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. So we reached out to BlackRock, or well, iShares, I guess, to see about having somebody on to talk about the new XGrow and XBAL products, which are, I guess, iShares' answer to Vanguard's asset allocation ETFs. The one decision ETFs, yeah. Yeah, sing, so it's, a, it's one one single ETF that gives you exposure to a globally diversified portfolio. So you buy one thing and you get everything that you need. Anyway, so Vanguard came out with one early last year and iShares answered la- late last year or early this year? Uh, late last year. Yeah. So anyway, we, we reached out to them and they were gracious enough to offer us Stephen Leong, who is the director, a director and the head of Canada iShares product at BlackRock. So, I mean, that's the guy to talk to, to get more information on this type of thing. And he was very interesting. He gave his perspective and the company's perspective on lots of different things from financial planning to future of advice, to what's worth paying for, to how to structure portfolios. He was very good. Yeah, it was insightful. Not not what I was going to say that I was surprised, but that's not what I mean. It it was, uh, he, he gave insight that I wasn't necessarily expecting based on the types of questions that we were asking. Yeah. It's definitely a, a good interview. And, and I think that these, these types of products, the asset allocation ETFs, as Stephen talks about in the, in the episode, they're, they're going to change the landscape for investors over the long term. And also the advice delivery too. Oh, for sure. How you structure your relationship with clients is definitely changing due to products like this. Yeah. I mean, we've made that transition ourselves, right? It was only when I, when I started is when we started going more towards asset allocation funds as opposed to building our own portfolios using ETFs and, and other index mutual funds. My opinion is that's the that's the future. The, the advisor can't really compete with BlackRock or say dimensional fund advisors on portfolio construction and management, but a financial advisor can compete on, uh, well, on advice. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So I, that's, that's where I think the business is going. And that's based on our conversation, BlackRock seems to have a similar view. Yep. So it's a good interview. Have a listen. Yep. We'll go ahead to the episode. So, Stephen, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. So, I'm sure our listeners have heard of BlackRock and probably iShares as well, but I don't know if they would understand the scope of the company and the size of the company. So, can you give us a quick overview of BlackRock's scope and size? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. So, BlackRock is a large investment management and risk management firm. We operate a global diversified platform. The company has r- roughly $6 trillion in assets under management worldwide. $6 trillion. Yeah, I know. Sometimes it's distracting even to say it out loud. That $6 trillion is diversified across a range of investment strategies and asset classes. So whether that's equities, fixed income, multi-asset, commodities, alternatives, hedge funds, and then also across index, factor, traditional active, quantitative active, very broad range of both strategies and asset classes. In terms of ETFs, BlackRock is very well known globally for for our iShares business of ETFs. We are the world's largest family of of ETFs with large platforms in the US, Europe, as well as Canada, Latin America, and Asia. And there's about $1.8 trillion in iShares ETFs globally. If we sort of shrink that down and look at, at the Canadian iShares business, we have about $57 billion in an ETF AUM. That, are, that is domiciled here in Canada. In wow. addition to the investment management business, BlackRock also operates the Aladdin platform, which is a portfolio management and risk platform that is used to manage all of BlackRock's in-house strategies, so that's $6 trillion, and also used by other asset and risk managers around the world. So there's, there's over $10 trillion, which is managed via Aladdin, if you will, not all of that by BlackRock. Wow. Interesting. I'd never heard of that. Okay. Now, Specific to Canada, in terms of BlackRock scope and size, th- there was a recent announcement that there's going to be a partnership with RBC for the ETF business. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that means? Yeah. So in early January of 2019, BlackRock in Canada, so the iShares ETF business in Canada, announced that it was entering into a strategic alliance with RBC Global Asset Management. And what that means is that the two organizations, BlackRock and RBC GAM, are really going to pool together their their efforts and resources in the ETF space with respect to the Canadian market. 
the alliance is going to operate under the, the combined brand RBC iShares, and the, the combined product family will be supported by, by both organizations. Now, it's important to, to bear in mind that both RBC and BlackRock will continue to operate um, the different families of ETFs within the scope of the alliance. So iShares branded ETFs will continue to be iShares branded ETFs, and those are predominantly index tracking strategies. RBC GAM will continue to operate RBC branded ETFs, and those are predominantly a factor and, and active strategies. And so the product families are not necessarily being uh, combined under a single brand, but the service and support is going to be our efforts are going to be combined by between BlackRock and RBC to really uh, deepen the amount of support available on, on the combined product family and also expand the reach of, of both firms into the Canadian market. That's really fascinating. I mean, the, I think everyone kind of knows that the ETF, the ETF game, the passive index game anyway, is a scale play. And obviously, this gives both RBC and iShares a huge amount of scale, more scale than they already had, which was already huge. In terms of scale, Steve, in, in Canada, you know, BlackRock launched a couple of one decision portfolios, the XGRO and the XBAL. So these are one decision portfolios that have, you know, pre built, diversified, auto rebalanced portfolios. Can you talk about, uh, about those portfolios? Yeah. So thanks for bringing that up. So well, the origin of, of these products is actually a little bit of a, of a remolding of some older multi asset class ETFs that. Had actually been launched by Claymore uh, several years ago, and that joined the iShares family in, in 2012. And these products were, were frankly kind of due for a facelift or, or a significant renovation. And so, in the, in late 2018, these portfolios actually were changed to to invest in a in a much more core like or or foundational asset allocation, with the idea that these could become it, it, these could really set a new standard for for single ticket or or you know all in one foundational portfolio tools where you're getting a diversified portfolio of both equities and fixed income diversified internationally. So if we look at the the way that these products are constructed, they each invest in eight other iShares ETFs, some Canadian listed, some US listed. They provide exposure to Canadian equities, US equities, international developed markets emerging markets, and then both Canadian and U.S. fixed income. And between them, they each have exposure to more than 16,000 individual securities. Wow. Sounds like a neat product. Was this, and I don't know to what extent you can answer the question, but was this uh, in a way a response to the, the, pro the similar product that Vanguard rolled out? You know, I think it's fair to say that the market clearly demonstrated that there was a significant appetite for products in this space. We had been looking at, at making improvements to, to the legacy strategies that I mentioned for some time, and it felt like the time was right. Cool. Now, one of the decisions that you guys made in portfolio construction for these asset allocation ETFs that was different from Vanguard's product, Vanguard's comparable product, but also different from, I mean, if we survey all of the different model ETF portfolios that, that are around the, the internet in Canada, like the Canadian Couch Potato, PWLs, model portfolios, Wealth simple, you know, all the all the big name ETF portfolio model portfolio providers, everyone's overweight Canada. And the new iShares products are still overweight Canada, but less so than the the common model portfolios. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I actually think it's important to kind of separate that out between equities and fixed income. So if you look in the equity uh, portfolio, and, and one of the things that we think is really neat, by the way, about these is the relative proportion of uh, Canadian, U.S., international, and emerging markets, and the equity, I believe, is the same for both XBAL and XGRO, just scaled whether the overall equity allocation is either 60% in the case of XBAL or or 80% in the case of, of XGRO. And, you know, if you were to look at just the this kind of market cap weighted basis, you, you know, the Canadian equity market would only be around uh, 4 or 5% of, of, you know, an equity holding. And, you know, our experience has been that Canadians simply want to have more, you know, more of that home country in their in their portfolio. It's where they're accustomed to. It's what they're used to. But we also wanted to to sort of nudge things a little bit. And, and so this this in a way is it's a middle ground between where you might get to on a on a sort of pure market cap basis and as you describe where the where the average is. 
we want these portfolios, you know, these these solutions to fit well into into existing Canadian portfolios. And so having that that higher than market cap weighting, we think makes sense. But at the same time, there is there's a ton of value that you get from from international diversification, particularly in equities. And so, as you point out, we have we have sort of toned the home bias down a little bit compared to what you might find um, typically. If we look at the fixed income allocation, uh, we find actually that there's a very large number of portfolios in Canada which hold only Canadian fixed income. So uh, we've included leave of, of U.S. fixed income here. It's about 20% of the of the fixed income allocation of, of each of XPAL and XGrow, where again, we think there's there's really valuable diversification that you get from that, You know, although the, the majority of the exposure is still to the familiar Canadian fixed income. Yeah, and one of the big advantages of these portfolios is the fact that it's a it's a one decision, all rebalanced automatically for the investor. I, I presume, you know, BlackRock, you must see this as being a huge behavioral advantage to your clients. Yeah, I think you you know we're strong believers in you know not having complexity where complexity is not required, and so I think that you know being able to buy this this diversified asset allocation, being able to simply buy a single a single ticker to gain access to it, and then to to be able to simply rely on effectively rules driven rebalancing. You know, not have to, you know, decide is it right for me to rebalance at this time or not. You know, my my strategy may tell me that it should be time, but there's lots of you know noise and reason why you know a person might not stick to their original plan. So yes, okay. I definitely think that the the discipline that you get with a strategy such as XBAL or XGrow is is definitely really valuable. And again, we're talking about something that's really intended to be the foundation of a broader portfolio. And again, you know, just that trusted, reliable, you know, not having to worry about foundational tool we think is really valuable. So we've now got between iShares, Vanguard and Horizons, three different options for Canadian investors to get access to, I mean, really, really good, well-diversified auto rebalance portfolios. And that kind of makes me wonder where is the role of the traditional portfolio manager that's doing asset allocation and stock picking and all that kind of stuff? Does BlackRock have a view or do, or do you have an opinion on, on where the traditional portfolio manager is going in the future? Absolutely. What, what I would say is that BlackRock is a strong believer in, in the value of, of investment advice and strong believer that investors are well served by, by having financial plans and, and, and using high quality advice. At the same time, we think that it is important to to really separate out, you know, where where are fees being paid and what are those fees being being paid for, and these portfolios are another representation or another way of of, of doing that. And the way that I would that I would characterize them is that these are a really really high quality canvas for portfolio managers to to really, you know, build the the customized client portfolios the the portfolios that are really you know, exactly tailored to each individual client's needs, where the portfolio manager is really empowered to spend more time on what are the, the, the higher value added complementary exposures and tools that can be that can be layered over top of strategies such as these, rather than needing to, you know, to rebuild uh, the asset allocation from, from individual components. We also see a lot of value here for, for, for complementary smaller accounts. So, uh, you know, you, you 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 know, many clients have more than one account with their with their portfolio manager or advisor, and so this is a way of having a consistent experience across both the the larger and smaller accounts that that a client may have. So, as you know, in the U.S., Vanguard offers I think it's called a personal advisor service, where investors get access to a human financial planning advisor for a pretty low fee. And we've heard some rumbling that Vanguard may be bringing that to Canada. Do you do you foresee a time when BlackRock will get into the advice business? No, it's not. It's not a business that we're in 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 other markets. We are when it comes to investment advisors, we we are very much you know focused on servicing servicing the advisor directly or the portfolio manager directly. So it's not something that we that we do elsewhere or that we're planning to do in Canada. All right. Now here's a question that BlackRock is better positioned than anyone to answer, I think. Fund fees have been racing downward. BlackRock and Vanguard have kind of been leading that, although Fidelity in the States last year did release the first, as far as I know, zero fee, zero MER anyway, index fund. So the question that I have is, do you think that 
fees on market cap weighted index funds like the ones used in Xgrow and Xpel. Do you think those fees or the MERs anyway are going to zero? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting question and and you know that the announcement from Fidelity I think has really kind of kicked off a lot of curiosity almost about whether this is this is sort of the direction we're going. But I think if you if you sort of peel the onion a little bit and and look at the details of of what was announced by Fidelity in the US, you know, I think you'll see that this is not likely to be, you know, a, a widespread phenomenon or, or sort of the prevailing the prevailing approach going forward. So I think there's there's a couple of things to unpack there. You know, we don't see the the clearing fee for for market cap exposure going to zero in a in a sort of universal way. These products they they cost money and and resources and and investment in technology and platform in order to manage them well and efficiently. And for the most part. You know, you have to charge some kind of a fee in order to make those investments continue to deliver a high quality experience to, to clients. It, you know, if you look at the details of what Fidelity did in the U.S., they specifically uh, introduced zero fee index funds, but not ETFs. Index funds where they could control the availability of that product, control who was able to access it or not access it, and the the access to those fees is actually limited to you know a few. Fidelity account windows or, or brokerage windows, and so these are these are customer acquisition tools. These are a way of of you know bringing new customers to Fidelity, and then the strategy is to find ways to sell them you know additional products or services where where that would be that would be fee charging. In the ETF context, that that really doesn't work because neither Fidelity nor BlackRock nor Vanguard could really prevent you know uh, an ETF from sold in, in one channel or another or on one platform or another, they're they're completely open architecture. And so again, we don't we don't really see a world where fees on those types of products could go could go to zero. It would be a really irrational calculus on on the part of the manager. And my um you know the the, the head of our Canadian US iShares business likes to say that, you know, banks gave away toasters for for many, many years to to bring customers in the door, but it didn't cause the prices of toasters to go to zero. I think that that is, you know, that's a very similar situation here. That's so interesting. And and I guess if fees did go to zero, the due diligence that investors would have to do to choose between two comparable, arguably no fee products becomes much more difficult, like looking into securities lending revenue and other sources of revenue that the investment company receives, correct? Yeah, you know, I think in a, in a high fee context, a low fee context, uh, you know, a, a single digit basis points fee context, which... You know, both iShares and, and others, uh, are, you know, we have products in, in that sort of range in Canada. You know, I think it's always, when evaluating those products, it's always a fee and quality question. And so uh, you're always trying to understand, you know, what is the fee I'm paying? And, and to your point, perhaps you need to fully understand, you know, all of the sources of, of fees or, or drag on the portfolio as well as the, the, you know, the normal criteria that you'd use to evaluate quality, particularly in ETFs. So how well does it track? Does it track the index that, that fits my portfolio? Um, what is the liquidity? What is the, the, the reputability of the manufacturer? Is it a high-quality manufacturer? Are they, committed? Are they committed to the space? And to the point about you know, free or close to free, you, you know, there is definitely the temptation, I suppose, for, for, for people to play little games in, in marketing space here. And so definitely need to make sure that, that you know, something is actually free if it's being promoted that way, because as, as I just mentioned, it tends to be not really economically sensible to deliver something for truly, for truly zero. Even if it is an index replicating product, there's, there's still costs associated with, uh, with operating it soundly, with complying with all applicable regula- regulations, things of that nature. I've got a question that kind of dovetails in with, in with this one. And it's about product structure. So one of the things that fund companies have done, ETF providers as well as mutual fund companies like Dimensional Fund Advisors, is they've, they've instead of tracking traditional market cap weighted indices, they've started to try and target specific factors. Now, iShares did launch some factor ETFs in Canada with higher fees, which you'd expect and is okay, assuming they're getting factor exposure. But one of the things that I noticed is that those products have gotten very little traction in the Canadian space anyway. I, I think they're getting a little bit more attention from individual investors, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on why the uptake to the, to the iShares factor products has been relatively slow. Yeah. you know, I think that 
we've started to hit, if you sort of look at the evolution of, of this conversation, we, you know, in Canada, I'd say we've started to, to reach the inflection point, or maybe we're just past the inflection point on indexing as, a, as an effective tool to be deployed in portfolios. It was not that long ago that portfolios in Canada, a significant majority of portfolios in Canada, would only hold either individual securities or actively managed funds. And we've now reached the point where, where indexing has become a lot more mainstream, primarily ETFs. We sort of leapfrogged the index mutual fund and went straight to the ETF in Canada. But the, the adoption of, of index products is, is really just, just hitting its stride in Canada. And I think that, you know, factors in, in a way sort of bears, bears out of the index conversation where once you've recognized or, or started to incorporate index, Factor is really a, a logical next place to go. It's 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 somewhere that sits in between the, the the more traditional stock picking and index strategies, where you're tapping into systematic drivers of return that are that are beyond beyond the market uh, and, and beyond just the the pure market risk factor. And so, you know, we do have a number of products in this space. We have a family of minimum volatility ETFs, which have been reasonably popular, but I think your point, still early days in adoption, as well as a, a multi-factor strategy, which, which incorporates value, momentum, quality, and, and low size. And we think that, that these will be an increasingly important part, or that factors will be an increasingly important part of investor portfolios in the same way that, that indexing has become an increasingly important part of portfolios. But we are very early in the adoption curve, point out. And so, you know, we build these funds uh, with forever in mind. And so I think that there's a, there's a really bright future for them. But you're right, we're still sort of in the early days. Speaking of early adoption, you know, Canada has been quite slow at adopting index strategies and portfolios, certainly compared to the U.S. And BlackRock being a massive global firm, do you have an opinion as to why Canada seems to be lagging the acceptance of index funds? So we, we see very, very similar trends in, in the wealth management space all around the world. And the underlying drivers that are leading to the greater adoption of, of indexing are the same in Canada as elsewhere. So that's things like the significant pivot towards fee-based advice and the, the increasing amount of regulation of both the, the disclosure of fees and, and the nature of fees that can or cannot be charged, as well as the transparency into, into both product and, and advice fees. And so... You know, where, where, whether it's Canada or the U.S. or in Europe, where exactly we are on the curve varies. And so to your point, I would say that, that yes, where we, from where we sit, it looks as though Canada is a little bit further behind than, say, a market like, like the U.S. But the trends are very similar and the adoption is very similar. We've seen really significant growth in the use of, of index ETFs in Canada in, in, you know, what, what we call full service brokerage or, you know, wealth advisory. And so we are very, very optimistic about the, the increasing use of, of these low-cost tools and portfolios in Canada. The, the need is the same, you know, to really efficiently figure out where, where should you be paying, you know, higher management fees? What, what sort of benefit should that be adding to the portfolio? Whereas where can you get really low-cost exposure to, to the market risk factor in a diversified way? And, and, you know, what should the fee for that be? I think it's going to be fascinating to see where, obviously, RBC Global Asset Management is a huge asset manager, and they do have a ton of actively managed funds with relatively high fees. It'll be interesting to see where product with RBC goes moving forward with this with this new, uh, uh, I know it's not a partnership, but the new relationship with iShares. That'll be interesting to watch. Yes. I mean, I think, you know, both, both RBC, GAM, and, and, and BlackRock recognize that in a portfolio, you need diversification of, of asset classes. You you also benefit from having diversification of, of investment strategies. So index, factor, active. And as an alliance, we want to be able to address every every part of that portfolio. And when when the two two firms sort of looked at that aspiration, looked at our respective strengths and product lineups, you know, it was clear that by by bringing by bringing the two the two organizations together. We could really accelerate the, the adoption of ETFs in Canada, really accelerate the, the growth of the use of these strategies, and, and, and really become the, the, the de facto go-to place 
for for ETFs in Canada. So we're we're really excited about this. So we we here at PWL are fairly hev- well fairly we're extremely heavily entrenched in the in the passive side or at least the factor side of of investing in portfolio management and obviously that's not the only way to do it with the growth of index funds and ETFs and and BlackRock sort of being at the forefront of that where do you guys see the future of traditional active like security selection and market timing versus market cap weighted index passive where do you see the future of that competition if it is a competition going yeah you know we don't think of it as a competition, and you know one one thing that we that we try to stress is that regardless of the types of building blocks used, all portfolios are active portfolios. Every portfolio it involves an investor or, or their advisor or portfolio manager, you know, really deciding what goes in, what what doesn't go in, and in what proportion. And so, we think of investing and, and portfolio construction as an inherently active process. In terms of the building blocks that are selected, you know, I think it is really valuable to have choice and it is really valuable to be able to understand what are the ways in which a, a, a portfolio can deliver returns and what are the fees being paid for, for access to that strategy. And so we do think that the more traditional forms of active management will increasingly be required to, to separate out where have returns come from. Where has return come from? How much of the return has come from exposure to factors or exposure to, to the market risk as a whole versus security selection or market typing, timing, things of that nature? And we think that it is really valuable to pay for effective active management in the sense that you're delivering risk-adjusted returns um, in excess of the benchmark. But we also think that if you're primarily getting market exposure, that there are, that there are more cost-effective ways of, of doing that. And so we are, in our mind, still very early in the days of, of adoption of, of these index building blocks as investors become increasingly knowledgeable about how to evaluate how to evaluate individual investment strategies. So given your role and your experience, I'm curious, what would be your most valuable piece of investment uh, knowledge or advice that you'd leave our listeners with? So I'm going to go with two, if you don't mind. You know, the first is is that Investors should 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 know that no amount is too small to get started. You know, particularly now that that there are products available that can really deliver a very diversified foundational portfolio for low cost and for for kind of low low investment thresholds. You know, there should be really no no aversion to saying you know this this can be for me, regardless of of how much you may have to invest. But then what I would add to that is there is incredible value in having a sound financial plan in not focusing completely on product selection decisions or even portfolio construction decisions but making sure that your overall financial plan and your you know your 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 savings behavior are are really fit for for what you're trying to achieve and you know working with advisors uh, or portfolio managers is a really valuable way to to put that plan together and then to make sure that 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 you're sticking to it you know, there's there's lots of ways to kind of sweat the detail of product selection or, or portfolio construction, but you know, you're really kind of missing missing the most important thing if you're not getting your own your own financial plan and aligned with your goals. So, would definitely uh, encourage everybody to make sure that they that they've sort of completed that step before launching into the index versus active or or you know, Vanguard and BlackRock. You know, keeping sort of the big picture in mind. It's good advice. Stephen, this has been wonderful. We really appreciate you taking the time. And it's it's really great to get your view and also BlackRock's view on all the questions that we asked. So again, we really appreciate it. Thanks very much. It was it was great being here. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen.